So as I said earlier, um, I'm going to present results of an ESPA project led by Thomas Secor, which is called Ecosystem Services, Wellbeing and Justice. And as the title of this talk uh, makes clear, this is an empirical study of environmental justice applied to a protected area in Lao PDR. So environmental justice is, is an emerging approach that's gaining uh, popularity and uh, quite a lot of impetus in different fields. And I'm going to assume certainly one or two of you know it pretty well, but I'm going to assume that people don't know so much about it, so explain that a little bit to you. Um, so first and foremost, environmental justice is a, a theoretical, uh, conceptual approach to researching social aspects of environmental issues. A lot of people think that it's just a, a tool for social activism, but first and foremost, I'm talking about a research approach here. Um, and environmental justice studies pay attention to three dimensions of, of such issues. They look at the distribution of costs and benefits, uh, the procedures through which decisions about distribution are made, and recognition of different identities and values in those procedures and distributions. Um, but this is not a normative definition of, of justice, of, of what is fair. This is quite an open a framework that can accommodate lots of plural notions of what is fair and even different philosophies about justice within it. So um, this, can, this can be used to apply to, uh, for example, indigenous philosophies of, of justice and incorporate lots of uh, different perspectives. And indeed, it's a, it's a way of exploring those plural perspectives and trying to understand where they come from and seeking ways to identify ways that can try and reconcile those, those different so it's so it's uh, quite a useful tool for looking at ecosystem t service trade-offs and trying to identify ways that can reconcile different stakeholders needs but so when we uh, look at a framework for applying to the research if we just start with that environmental justice framework it's pretty skeletal there's not much there with these three dimensions to to start with, you can look at people's different notions of what is fair there and the claims that people make about injustices that are happening to them. But really, to understand where those are grounded, uh, you need to kind of to, to add well-being to that, to understand people's values and the situations in their lives from, from which those claims and people's notions of fairness stem. Additionally, we'll add to that, uh, this is a dynamic system, so the drivers of change in people's well-being that affect people's claims about justice. And then here we have a framework really of social justice. We need to add in an environmental aspect. So we'll put in the ecosystem services there. Um, so ecosystem services represent resources to people in their well-being. Um, and uh, the, then actually feeds back through people's claims about justice um, and their well-being that affects the, the way people see and demand different ecosystem services. I won't go too heavily into this, but I just want to make the point that this is essentially an ESPA framework. Just the S and the PAR are kind of hidden inside this bigger load of concepts there. Um, there's more complex things happening. So uh, now let's take this to the field. And we've applied this framework in communities around Nemet Pulai, protected area in uh, northeast Lao PDR. And uh, this protected area was established in 1993, but the, the boundaries were not really set up until around 2008. There's around 100, 100 villages on the edge, about 30,000 people. It's a very big area, about 6,000 square kilometers of montane forest. Um, and in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, all of the villages that were initially inside that forest were relocated outside, um, not as part of conservation, but of political processes happening at the time within Laos. So that's important for understanding justice issues as well. <coughs> the main uh, livelihood around the area is shifting cultivation of rice, although that's changing to a certain extent. And um, as well as having the protected area rules, there's also land use planning processes which determine where people can farm and which forest people have in their land and, and those things as well. The protected area is in Huopan province here in the northeast of Laos. 
And as you can see from the coloration, this is a relatively pro poor province within Laos itself. It's a remote and mountainous area that's it's quite far from um, some of the biggest cities in the country. Now, the protected area is also um, a bit of a, a frontier for biodiversity conservation. So, for example, there's a very large number of um, threatened large mammals in the area. It's really highly biodiverse and very highly threatened. Um, and a lot of the populations are declining um, and, and have a, a large importance in the wider um, Indochina region. So what have we been doing? We've done a mixed method study in just three villages on the edge of the protected area. Um, and we selected those three villages because they have different types of conservation interventions that affect them. Um, importantly, the village here, Ponsong, shown inside the protected area, uh, is surrounded by a total protection zone. So they have a complete restriction on what people can do there. The second village, Konua, down here, um, has a controlled use zone where certain uses in the forest are allowed. Um, and then the third village, which is not as far away from the protected area as shown here, um, but they have an ecotourism scheme, so they receive some benefits. Those are the three different schemes that go on. Um, and so to look at issues of justice in communities, there's often some sensitive and political issues there. It requires building up a, a good amount of trust with communities. So we had a long introductory period and spent uh, two months in those villages before we've done any formal procedures so that people understand the purposes of our research and where we're coming from and so that we have a greater understanding of them as well so that we, we get some more expansive answers and, um, and cover the range of justice issues that are affecting them. Um, and essentially in this talk, I'm going to present the results of semi-structured interviews and life history interviews with individuals from 100 households across those three villages. There's a scatter of other um, methods that we've used there, um, including GIS analysis, some household diaries for resource collection to look at the range of e ecosystem services of importance, but I'm, I'm going to focus on those household surveys here. So we'll get into some of the results now. Um, and some of the major changes occurring uh, include the park boundaries being established, a lot of development projects to improve services in the area, education and, and, and health centers for all of the villages around there. And there's, there's been some livelihood di diversification, but the major change which has happened in people's lives since 2000 has been the change from um, cultivation of rice for subsistence and some sale, but limited sale, to cash cropping of maize. Um, and that happened around 2010 in all of the villages, and that's maize to feed livestock in Vietnamese markets. And that means that very rapidly people's incomes have gone from being negligible to being, on average, around $1,000 per annum. Um, so it's, it's had a big effect on people there. Um, and when we look at some poverty indicators, we see some very rapid declines because of that, and people's household assets have improved a lot, even people having TVs and motorbikes a great deal. So there's been a lot of improvements. <coughs> but I want to spend a bit of time, before we go into the justice results, looking at some of those poverty dynamics and exploring a little more about how those changes are affecting people. If we look at the multidimensional poverty index, which is a kind of global consistent indicator that uses 10 different indicators for health, education, household assets, and services, um, and, and gives people a rating based on those, in 2004, you see here that not a single one of those 100 households was considered not poor. All were at least vulnerable to poverty, and quite a large proportion were living in severe poverty. In 2014, we see a very rapid shift. So more than half households, half of households have moved out of poverty, and that's the same for all three villages, quite consistent. <coughs> but when we look at poverty in a slightly different way, and we look through our well-being work, and um, similarly to Gisela's talk and Carlos's talk this morning, looking at more locally relevant um, measures of, of poverty, we came up with some indicators um, based around land, livestock, and food security, and one in particular is uh, rice sufficiency for these households. 
So now people are, maybe aren't growing so much um, rice as they did in the past, um, and they have increased incomes, but it doesn't mean that they can feed the, feed the family so well. So, so uh, local people thought that as an indicator whether a family can either grow or afford to provide enough rice for their household year round is an important indicator of poverty there. And here we see that that shows a completely different trend to the, um, to the conventional poverty indicators. So for each village, uh, there's an increasing percentage of households who are becoming rice insufficient. Um, and why is this an issue for conservation? Well, if we look at which village this is worse in, then we have PS, the one with the most strict conservation measure, measures affecting it. There, 43% of households now are unable to provide enough rice to feed their household with. And that leads on to some of the, the justice issues as well. So that has strong implications for the SDGs <coughs> and for aspartite work, which I'll just go into briefly. Um, some of these simple comparative measures based on things like education and, 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 and health perhaps don't incorporate some factors that might be important for local people and also important for um, ecosystem management as well. There is some evidence that MDG approaches perhaps have been effective in uh, reducing poverty but have maybe been skimming the surface and not reaching some of the poorest of the poor. Um, and I think uh, some of my work in Rwanda has shown that. I would suggest that even um, Hans Rosling's analyses that if we carry on in the same vein that we can bring everybody out of poverty is perhaps not quite right. Um, so as I was saying earlier, um, perhaps we need some more nuanced looks at, um, at, at poverty, at defining poverty and well-being, and linking it to ecosystem services to try and understand how uh, we can affect that change. So it's important to look beyond some of these mainstream approaches. And there is still scope within national SDG approaches to incorporate um, some, some novel methods to do so, even though these 169 indicators have been set. I think there's a lot of scope to bring um, more innovative approaches to, to poverty alleviation in. Uh, which leads me to a short, small plug for a book that's recently out called Mixed Methods Research in Poverty and Vulnerability, uh, which hopefully something will appear on the ESPO website and newsletter soon about that as well. Okay, so moving back to, to justice, let's link these, these changes back to our, our justice approach. And looking firstly at the distribution dimension, um, again, if we look at the three villages here, uh, PS, our village that's subject to the strictest conservation measures, we see that people's incomes and amount of land that people have there is much lower than the other villages, statistically significantly so. And this leads to knock-on effects. So within that village, as people have changed to maize, um, People have reduced ability to ro rotate their fields. The soil quality has reduced more. There's increased need for inputs. And people in that village have more debt because they need the machinery to be able to work the land harder. Um, so it's not just these um, material distributions, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot of other knock-on effects happening there. And also, illegal forest clearance is greater. And the number of fines that villagers are subject to each year, the amount of conflict, you might say, with the National Park authorities, uh, is much higher in that village. And the solution that's been taken through the formal land use planning processes to deal with this injustice, if you like, is to degazette part of the national park and provide it to that village at the, at the village level. And I can show you through our, um, our justice approach that that, as well as being a poor solution for ecosystem services or for forest conservation, it's also a poor solution for poor people within that village. Because when we look at the procedural dimensions of justice, we see that the informal complex procedures by which people can access land is a major issue for, for people there, particularly for the poor. There's a lot of um, barriers, particularly within that one village, that prevent poor people from being able to access land. 
they put land in the hands of, of the powerful. To the extent that the land within the national park is even said to be booked by certain people. So when the land is distributed to people within the village, the ownership is already determined. It's already known who owns that land. So, so these are major factors in the poor being unable to benefit from the change to maize. They take on the risk of growing a crop that they can't eat, but without the access to land, they can't really make that work for, for them. And we see a lot of those households now turning away from maize and turning back to, to rice production. Okay, thank you. So instead of seeking a distribution of more land at the village level, through our justice workshops and interviews we've had with households, particularly the poorer households, would say that they would value um, as a better solution more consistency to rules, more consistent enforcement, um, and also certain pro-poor measures. And those kinds of measures might lead to improved, more just outcomes, as well as being better for forest conservation. So there's alternative solutions that come out of this. When we look at the recognition element, and look at people's uh, values and identities, we see a rapid change happening there. So as well, um, people might be considered to be shifting cultivators, and the land that's been granted to that village is some, some upland areas that they might be able to use for, for rice and maize production. But people's identities are changing rapidly, and don't, they, people don't value that type of land as much anymore. So people are looking for um, more sedentary farming and looking for uh, more productive flatland in the valley bottoms. And actually, claims are growing rapidly for land within the protected areas, sometimes which was associated with their previous villages up to 30, 40 years ago that they were moved out of the forest from. And these are claims that have been dormant or unexpressed for a long time, but because of these changing circumstances has, have come to the fore. And it's important to state also that um, the uh, management of the National Park are fairly oblivious to some of these social changes happening within the villages. So they might look to benefit people in terms of giving them more upland land or um, seek to enhance their current livelihoods, whereas people are, are looking to change. And one of the big factors um, in people engaging in certain land uses, um, when people, when the protected area boundaries were established, the protected area managers made a lot of promises about support for people to be able to change their livelihoods. And a lot of that support didn't materialize. So these broken promises um, have had an impact too. So the implications of this, very quickly, just a second to last slide. Um, an environmental justice approach can help increase our context-specific uh, understanding of ecosystem services and poverty. This is essentially an ESPA framework that can be applied to ESPA-type problems. Um, but justice is not really easily reduced to indicators for fairness. Um, it's really more of a tool for addressing the complexity, the social complexities involved. And it leads us to question certain conservation strategies. So I've sat down and had workshops with uh, some of the national park managers and some of the development organizations working there to, to try to think about why they're seeking to, to benefit certain people. Um, oh, and, and it's led to some very interesting conversations about who has suffered the cost of conservation, but where are the benefits going? And uh, leads people to strategize about that. But it also suggests that if you have lots of different perspectives, and you're seeking um, pro-poor um, inter interventions to help people there, that there's not going to be one single blueprint solution that works. Suddenly growing coffee in that area or, or one solution isn't going to solve all those problems. It's about a range of solutions to different people's needs. And so what are we doing to try and effect change there? Well, we're working at the local level with the protected area management. And as I said, we're using some of those results to challenge the kind of logic behind uh, the conservation costs and benefits um, that are being applied. But one thing we're also doing is trying to reduce our methods 
into a, a, a single participatory tool that's useful in that context. And we're, so we're designing um, a tool alongside uh, some Lao government officials that would enable them to, to engage in a dialogue with local people um, and not just have this tool there that's used every year or six months within a village, but to try to detail the procedures by which that leads to decision making. So that information being fed back to people at, at the top of the chain <coughs> in what is quite a hierarchical system. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, I wonder if you could look at, you said claims were context specific, that claims were only voiced in certain contexts. Mm. I wonder if you can just talk a little bit, if you have a specific example, even better, but the methods that evoked different voices, and, and you may need an example actually to, <laughs> to demonstrate that. Yeah. OK, so let's think about the uh, situation where people are criticizing the distribution of land within a village, which involves people criticizing their village leadership, really. Um, so I mean, it took a long time to get to a people might do that in an individual interview, perhaps not in a, a survey type interview, but say in the life history type interview where we're having a more in-depth discussion about things with people, they, they might voice it there. But an initial uh, focus group that has a randomly selected eight people there, that issue might not quite come to the fore. But then later, after we've been working with the community for a while, and I was quite <coughs> surprised at this, the justice workshops we held at the end as a means to feed back some of our information, there um, would suddenly, so one, quite elderly woman would stand up in a room, predominantly of men, with all the village leaders there, and openly criticize people in that circumstance. So it's hard to pinpoint one particular method where it's, it's going to happen and work. But I think over time, having built up that relationship and people <laughs> understanding the purposes of art, it yeah, can empower cool. people. Hi. Um, I didn't understand one thing. First, you said that with the uh, mice, uh, uh, the change to to oh yeah yeah to mice cultivation, uh, it seemed it improved their situation. But afterwards, it was worse. So I I understood that maybe the rice uh, could cover less months than before, but because they have produced mice. So they could cover that 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 uh, minor production of rice with the money coming from mice. Some people can. Um, pretty much all households choose to continue to grow some rice at the same time to cover some of their subsistence needs, but people can earn a much higher income from growing maize. One of the complexities is that because everybody in the whole region. Um, to feed these large Vietnamese and Chinese markets has shifted production to maize, the price of rice has increased a lot. Um, so that means that, that when people do take the risk to grow maize um, and they earn income, they still might not necessarily be able to uh, afford rice. And partially because for the people who have a smaller amount of land, they need to take a certain amount of credit from the maize company to, for the seeds and for the tools, perhaps for machinery to plow their land uh, at the same time. So once they harvest their maize, they need to pay back a certain amount of money to a company that they've borrowed from. So there's a lot of risks that people take on board there. Um, and some people might think, well, I'd be better off just subsisting and growing my own rice in the end. But the people who have enough land and enough labor as well to profit can do very well out of that. Uh, sorry, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. It was really interesting. Uh, I'm going to make two questions. Uh, I think both are very unfair. But anyway, here we go. <laughs> uh, 
The first one is that, well, you highlighted this issue about listening to different voices, which is something we were discussing in the morning as well. But so how would you frame this issue within the topic of valuing ecosystem services in a context such as the one you were working in? And secondly, in the same direction, I'm thinking as a whole, how would you frame uh, your results within these discussions about modeling social ecological systems? How, I mean, I said those are quite unfair, but I would like to hear your <laughs> opinions on, the, on those things. Thank okay, you. yeah. No, you're... You're perfectly right to be unfair. Uh, <laughs> I'll start with the modeling question, um, because it's a fairly simple answer that I would not choose to boil this down to a model. I think it's, it's more powerful <laughs> as, a, as a story in itself with all its complexities. And I think um, by a model, we're talking about something statistical do you mean something st statistical there? It's very hard to show those associations statistically. Um, and if we had chosen to do so, we would have chosen a much greater sample size of households to enable us to do that. Now, it could be quite powerful if we'd done both at the same time and if we had enough resources to do these detailed interviews with 100 households and then collect much more objective data with 2,000 households to show it at the same time. And that would be a great mixed method study our grant doesn't really cover that much field of it. Um, then to framing the valuation of ecosystem services, uh, briefly dealing with it, I would say that we have to look at different types of valuation of ecosystem services between, um, between poor, marginalized households, potentially, and and wealthier households splitting in that way. But there is also, um, as you were saying this morning, in people valuing rice, it's not only for their subsistence. This has a very strong cultural importance there. There's a big overlap between um, this provisioning service, service of having enough food to eat and what you're eating and how you're doing it with whom. And it has a big cultural aspect as well. So that's something I haven't touched upon here. I've made it sound somewhat simplistic, but those elements are also. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just have a question, and that is, in, in rational economics, um, those who have money to pay for rice and who need rice would probably just pay someone to grow the rice for them, because there seems to be some rice growers. And so, so how is that dichotomy now actually working out, and what's driving it? Yeah, there's a surprisingly small um, labor market for, for farming locally. There are some elements uh, that go on, and it's potentially shifted to, uh, to other daily tasks, like firewood collection and, and timber collection and, and, and building of things, and looking after livestock as well. There are, but it surprises me that the, the labor market there is so small. So in Laos, compared to... Rwanda, where I've been working beforehand, where um, yeah, larger households with land would, would straight away get other people and pay them a small amount of money to, to do that laboring for them. Here, it's more about networks and family. So people get their, their families and, and younger generations to do that farming work rather than paying others. ESPA is complex. Yeah. All right, so we have a break now, and then we get back in half an hour. And then we have drinks after that. <laughs>